Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is An End-to-End -End Automated Workflow for High-Throughput SARS-CoV-2 Sequencing and Surveillance, and our sponsor is Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Our panelists for today are Dr. Vladimir Benish, Head of the Genomics Core Facility at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, Jürgen Zimmerman, Senior Engineer for Automation at the EMBL, Dr. Tobias Rausch, a bioinformatician at the EMBL, and Nayara Trevisan Doimo de Azevedo, a research technician at the EMBL. You can type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar screen. And if you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Please go ahead. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you are hearing us. It's my great pleasure to present you the project we have been carrying out in EMBL Gene Corps in Heidelberg, Germany, in attempt to cover the automated workflow for high throughput SARS-CoV-2 sequencing and surveillance. In my presentation, I briefly introduce the institute we are working in, the activities the gene core specifically carries out, and introduce the project as such before I hand the floor over to my colleague, Nayara, who will continue. We are working in the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, shortly EMBL, which is truly the only European intergovernmental organization for life science research. You see in the lower part of the slide what the Institute is about in a nutshell, but there are five principal missions, certainly excellent research, support of the scientific community through providing access to the scientific services, advanced training, such as its own PhD program, innovation and translation through technology transfer, and also integrating life sciences across Europe. As EMBL is not only an intergovernmental organization, but it's also the institute with distributed infrastructure, and it is occupying six sites. There's uh, Heidelberg in Germany as its main seat, but perhaps you heard about EMBL more in connection with its Bioinformatics Institute, the so-called EBI, which is in Hingston, UK, jointly on the campus with uh, Wellcome Trust Sanger Genomic Center. Then there are two sites devoting their activities to structural biology, Grenoble in France and uh, Hamburg in Germany. The Rome site, its main role is studying epigenetics and neurobiology, having mouse as its model organism, and the last addition to the family of EMBL sites is uh, in Barcelona, Spain, which is uh, focusing on tissue biology and disease modeling. Main goal, and now I'm moving to gene core or genomics core facility of EMBL, is truly to support scientists in their genomic projects. Nowadays, of course, it's mainly about next generation sequencing, but we provide a complete support in the wet lab Oh, and of course, there are some necessary pieces of hardware equipment required for converting nucleic acid samples to NGS libraries, but we don't stop there. And we are further helping our colleagues and the community in shaping and designing their projects, providing the data analysis support, but also building up tools, for example, that mentioned GEAR genomics 
www.ebmbl.com and being consistent with the mission of EMBL also in teaching and training. Lastly, EMBL GeneCore participates in SARS-CoV-2 screening and currently also sequencing of this virus genomes within the Baden-Württemberg Initiative, and that's what the presentation is primarily about. So the project nutshell, and I give you a couple of vignettes. So what the motivation? There has been decided on the German federal level by regulation that is necessary to monitor and surveillance the viral variants and its distribution or day distribution in population. As the execution of the project has been carried out as a, or is carried out as a retrospective analysis of all qPCR positive samples in Baden-Württemberg, and this is executed jointly with the Department of Virology at University of Heidelberg and German Cancer Research Center, DKFZ. The approach we have chosen is to follow the modified so-called Arctic AmpliSeq protocol is the reference uh, provided, which technically means is a direct amplification of viral genome converted to cDNA with styled highly multiplex oligonucleotides. I would like to mention the firstly a competitive advantage which we believe has helped us execute the project, and that is a truly long-term fruitful collaboration with New England Biolabs, further referred by to as NEB, and Beckman Culture Life Sciences. And that enabled us to join forces into this another and so far very fruitful collaboration with NEB on optimization of the content and the protocol and Beckman Culture Life Sciences on automation of the protocol. The samples provided to us as RNA isolated from nasopharyngeal swabs, and that per se represents one of the caveats of the method because those samples are frequently highly fragmented. The protocol, as mentioned, we are using uh, the kit from New England Biolabs uh, with the fragmentation step with the FS module. The sequencing technology, we were deciding if to use either nanopore by Oxford nanopore technology or sequencing by Illumina, where we considered parameters like stability, output, speed, and so on and so forth. But at the end, decided that we are most efficient with pooling up to 384 samples and including controls on the medium flow cell of the Illumina NextSeq 500 sequencer. But of course, the libraries, as the, when they are prepared, they are compatible with any sequencer from Illumina. Now I am going to pass the floor on to my colleague Nayara, who has implemented and further optimized the protocol. Over to Nayara. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nayara, and I work as a research technician in the Gene Corps at EMBL. I will present you the NEB Arctic Protocol Overview, share my experience and important things to keep in mind when choosing this approach. So here on the right side, the picture shows the, the protocol overview. So first step of the protocol is the cDNA synthesis with exomers and DT primers. Then the cDNA product is split in two reactions of targeted amplification of SARS-CoV-2 genome regions, each reaction with a different primer set. And uh, either any BRTX version 3 or Varsky primers can be used, but after testing, we concluded that Varsky primers were working the best for our purpose, uh, since it works better with some variants such as Delta. Uh, then, those reactions are combined, followed by cDNA enzymatic fragmentation. Uh, 
um, uh, DA tailing to prepare the fragments to receive the adapters uh, which ligate to the A with their overhang T. Part of the ligation reaction is then used for PCR amplification with barcoded primers, which during amplification will insert barcode sequences on both sides of the fragment. And here is one example of the whole fragment, which is then cleaned up and followed by sequencing. Um, then on the left side, there's one example of how the primers are designed, aiming the overlapping of fragments in order to provide better coverage of the genome and avoid any gaps. So the NEB Arctic, Arctic protocol is quite robust and works well with different input amounts and variable RNA integrity. So we start the protocol with eight microliters of sample without any prior QC step. Considering that, that there are many cycles of targeted PCR amplification, it's important to include controls in the reaction to evaluate any indication of contamination in the plate. Another big advantage of the protocol is that it works very well without any cleanup step. There's only a final cleanup of the pool before sequencing. And uh, yeah, as I said, considering the high number of samples we need to process, uh, we do not perform any QC of individual libraries. They're all pooled in equal volumes, and then there's a bit cleanup of the final pool. Uh, one should also consider the infrastructure in terms of thermal cyclers available if aiming to scale up the production. Because the number of thermal cyclers is the bottleneck of this workflow. Uh, because at some point in the protocol, the number of samples is duplicated. Um, and here there are a few examples of spinalizer traces in different steps of the protocol. We receive a purified RNA, and the extraction is performed by other two labs at the University of Mannheim and Heidelberg. And um, as I mentioned, we take eight microliters of sample volume into library preparation because it works well with uh, variable inputs. It goes as low as 10 copies of SARS-CoV-2. And usually the RNA we get is degraded as you can see in the in this picture here. Mm, and um, after the the RNA, there's RT and cDNA amplification. And here's one example of the cDNA amplify. Then uh, after fragmentation, adapter ligation, and PCR. Here's e, here is one example of the traces we get with the libraries still with uh, excess of adapters and primers. Then those libraries are pulled, uh, and there's a 0.9 bid ratio cleanup. And then finally, here's the one example of the final pool uh, that we get with the majority of fragments around 300 base pairs. And now I'll pass the word to my colleague, Jürgen. Yeah, thank you. My name is Jürgen. I'm responsible for the automation uh, at GeneCore in EMBL. And I'd like to give you a short overview about the processes we are running, what is the philosophy behind the infrastructure, uh, how the automation per se was set up, and actually uh, the results we get out of it. Actually, we are running several workflows related to SARS-CoV-2 detection. There's one branch which is utilized for the fast detection and one for making this uh, variant surveillance. In the first case, we are doing the extraction based on the bomb bio protocol, utilizing uh, the purification of nucleic acids by binding them uh, to glass surfaces in the presence of cryotropic salts. Uh, 
on the Biomega XP, we are setting up the NEP lump assay, which is then uh, detected in the caloric metric readout, which is made offline. For doing the SARS-CoV-2 surveillance, we are getting the RNA from the two clinics in Mannheim and Heidelberg, and then performing the protocols which have been introduced by Nayara, and this is automated on the Biomec i7. The libraries are analyzed in a later step on the Illumina next sec. During the next section, I'd like to show you just briefly the infrastructure we have in place physically to do the jobs. Our automation infrastructure is mainly based on Biomech systems. What you're seeing here is a Biomech E7 and two older Biomech FXP. The general layout is in principle the same. So they're all carrying uh, on-deck cyclers, they're all carrying washing stations, shakers, and loading systems. So in principle, it's possible to map the jobs uh, on different systems if necessary, and keep also a certain throughput if one of the system is failing, which is actually really quite rare to happen. And um, with the same systems, we are also doing normal standard library preparations during our normal businesses at Core. In the next slides, I will show you actually how we map the manual process of NetNext Arctic FS SARS-CoV-2 library preparation on the Biomec i7. Um, in this slide, I have put several approaches. Actually, I showed you on, on the top how the whole process is performed in a manual operation, and actually the two different ways to automate it with more or less the same hardware infrastructure before you're thinking about parallelization by just buying more robots. So on the top you see just the manual uh, hands-on times and also the incubation times. And you see actually, despite the very favorite results, uh, actually main time is used for incubation. So you need, as Naira mentioned already, time for uh, doing the PCRs, or also for standard incubations on, on systems or in, in the manual lab. So the rate limiting step in this process is really incubation, heating, and cooling. And actually, that's also difficult to shorten and optimize the process per se. So the only way to make it uh, just with one system really faster is to make pipetting faster. And actually, this is what we have done in the current approach. Actually, we are doing pre-dispensing from reservoirs into microtiter place, and so we can just pipette with a 96 well head and just copying and stamping in plates. And of course, this is much faster than doing it in the serial pipettes. So in principle, we can save some time over the manual process, uh, but it's not so excessively. So the standard protocol we have is also therefore offering some time saving, definitely, but it also allows overnight operation that there is no manual interference needed uh, either in a smaller sample number, namely here 48 samples, there's no manual interference needed. Or if you're thinking about 96 samples, you just have to do it once in the beginning and then the whole system is operating for the rest of the time. Uh, the other approach is, uh, which I call mixed serialization, actually it's coming from the aut automation industry, which is called serialization. And actually you are starting sample set consecutively. Currently, uh, if you're just performing the manual process one after another, it's just coming uh, one set of samples after eight hours. So if you are just starting the things consecutively and looking where right rate limiting, rate limiting steps are, uh, you can actually start for a set nearly every 
two hours or three hours another set. So actually the first set of samples is coming after this long time, but the next set is then coming after two or three hours, and by this way you can do this. So it's time saving, definitely, it's increasing throughput, but you need just additional PCR incubators. In principle, the i7 can really uh, upscale in a very tremendously amount. So here, I just like to show you that actually uh, the whole way of programming the system is quite transparent. So actually, you can work with logical structures where you're actually giving the same name like you have in the biological protocols. And this is actually then splitting up into substructures where you see very simple commands which are actually following the operations you are actually doing like aspiration, pipetting, moving plates around on, on deck. So actually you can follow what the system is doing programmatically and it's just at a very high level not going in, into substructures. And, uh, actually, this is the deck which is running below. The robot is consisting on two arms, which is one loaded with a 96 well head. In our case, you can also operate it with a 384 well head. So by just quadruple the throughput, actually, we haven't done this up to now. And there's a span 8 arm, which is have eight channel. And also, they all have gripper systems for moving plates around. Both arms can work independently and this is also what we are utilizing that actually one system is pre-dispensing and pre-loading a plate during actually the system is in incubating. So we have already partial serialization on the system itself. But coming back to the deck, so there's a core section of pass passive elements which are here called P or TL something. And there you, you can place boxes, plates, moving moving them around. Um, there are TLs, which are tip loaders. They are, they are reserved for low loading boxes. TR is for trashing. So they are just passive and don't do anything per se. On the deck, we have three Peltier elements for cooling. And actually, one is reserved for cooling master mixes. As the process is quite long, we have to ensure a certain stability of the chemicals on deck. And the, the same is for the incoming samples or intermediate storage during the process itself. There is an orbital shaker on deck just for additional mixing purposes. Uh, what is quite important is uh, the function which is called WS1. And this is a washing station. And uh, the quite specific one of this is we have 96 channels in that washing station. So each of the individual positions, tips, is washed individually by a large flow of liquid coming from the system itself and by pipetting in and out at the same time. We check the functionality of this part of the system with endpoint PCR and actually really at high amplifications up to 36 we couldn't detect any contamination so we decided also uh, to include washing tips into the process per se and actually this allows cost savings definitely but actually it's found itself a limit as the surface of the tips is changing over time if you are washing too frequently so Definitely, there's a limit in washing, but actually, it's really adding up a lot of power to the system. If you're talking about the bomb bio system, for the whole purification process, we just need two boxes, and that's all. And here, we are actually saving tip boxes for the complete purification step in the system. On the left edge, uh, there's a section called for from LF1 to LF5, which is called labware feeders, which means if you are thinking going into scaling, it's possible for each of the labware feeders to store at least 20 micro titer plates and 10 tip boxes into the system to feed them step by step 
when you need them in and really drop them completely uh, in the trash section. The thing which is called ATC here is the on-deck cycler, which is performed not only the, the cycling per se, but also the incubation steps. And some people may be not familiar with this way. And of course, you have to pre prepare to uh, protect the samples from contamination and also seal the microtiter plates uh, that there's no evaporation taking place. There are several ways to do this. There are disposables. You can buy on the market the other way is to work with arched lids uh, out of metal, and this is the way we are decided going for, because cost is definitely a driving factor in all of the protocols we are running. And actually, by just bleaching them and washing them, drying them, you can reuse them just in nearly indefinitely. We are using reusing them currently up to more than 100 times and haven't seen any de degradation. Uh, and they are really enabled type sealing. This is the entry screen from the user phase. And actually, uh, the numbers of samples is variable. So actually, you can start with one sample, of course, which is not very meaningful. But you have flexibility in sample numbers. So you can decide whether you like to go use the on-deck cycler or if you like to go immediately off deck and just using the machine for pipetting purposes and fill the cyclers in your lab or even if you like to make it in a somehow mixed operation. And uh, then, then you have options. So you can just perform individual steps, if you like, or groups of steps, just when it makes sense and to optimize the throughput uh, in, in your lab. If you need to do some optimization, because what we have to do, fragmentation time, just to see if uh, fragmentation times are too short or too long, depending on the outcome in the fragment length. You have influence on the number of cyclings during am amplification. And you can decide to go for a double purification if on the left edge your library is not steep enough or you see still some purifications in the uh, impurity, sorry. Um, there's another function, actually, which is helping the user, especially novices, to go to the system when you are filling up the deck. As there are several components, you have to put on it like plates, uh, tips, and the number is not too small. Let, let's call it this way. Uh, you just have a disguided lip fair set up. And actually, you are just clicking uh, on the different logical groups, and you just get displayed step by step what has to be filled. And even if there are staples of microtiter plates, you get them resolved and labeled. Um, it's also doing the master mix calculations, because we decided to go uh, setting up the master mix manually. The main reason is uh, if you are doing this fully automated already from that step, uh, for this type of solutions, you have increased dead volumes. If you're doing manual uh, setup of master mixes, you can really uh, rescue all the solutions from the initial commercial kits. And this can, especially if you are operating in high throughput mode with multiples, of kits you are processing in a shorter time, this saves money. And so we went that way. And uh, as you see on, on the right side, this blue box is this master mix holder. And actually, this is filling uh, dependingly on the number of samples you are processing. So if you have a smaller number of, number of samples, you just have uh, one or two master mix tubes in there. So the system is just utilizing one tip holder to pipe it. But if it's filling, then it's have up to four. And you can pipe it with four tips simultaneously. And then pipetting speed is really quadruples immediately. And there are also some other ways of uh, optimization in movement, which are possible then. And a deck layout, where actually the user is ending. 
so. And then actually the more trained user can skip all steps in, in between and jump uh, immediately to there to see where he has the place uh, thing. There you see the button save to PDF and actually this is already quite nice as we get the feedback from the lab. You just save it just for documentation because it's saving the user which method, which version of the method has been used, uh, which samples have gone on the system. So you have everything documented. This is one thing. You can print it out and especially for the calculations of the master mixes and setting up of the master mixes, you can do it as your bench. You don't have to be close to the machine for that. This is uh, the primary output coming from the robot. So this is showing the library uh, on a high sensitivity chip and this is roughly comparable to the manual output to get and you see there's and this is after a single purification, so you see some impurities in the beginning at a very small range, which you also saw on, on the other slides before, but actually it's not disturbing at all the sequencing output at the end. But actually as nice or as ugly libraries may look like at the end what it's counting is really the sequencing results, and actually I like to move on to Tobias, who is the expert for that. Yeah, hello everyone. So as the last part of the presentation, I would like to walk you through the SARS-CoV-2 data analysis and, and quality control by giving you an overview of how the data looks like. So what we are looking at here is a screenshot from, from IGV, which is a genomics viewer. And at the top you have the reference, the SARS-CoV-2 reference. And as you know, the viral genome is about 30,000 base pair long. So we are looking here only at a small fraction of it, about 1,000 base pair. And one thing Nayara already mentioned is that we have overlapping amplicons. And that, of course, means that at the portion where those amplicons overlap, we actually see an increase in coverage. And this coverage track is just underneath the reference. And what you also can see there are all these gray bars are basically individual sequencing fragments that were aligned against the reference. And if they are just displayed in gray, it basically means they match perfectly to the reference. And then you can see a bunch of sequencing errors where you have individual colors. But then you also see these long lines of color going you know, from the top to the bottom. And those are, of course, mutations with respect to the reference or variants with respect to the reference. It's a bit confusing for SARS-CoV-2 because people talk about variants when they talk about alpha beta, gamma, delta, and so on, so the different lineages. But actually, for bioinformatics people, we talk about variants, and we usually talk about these nucleotide substitutions. And that's exactly what we are looking at here. So basically, a substitution from A to G is highlighted here. And, and then, of course, using certain tools, one can translate this into amino acid changes for certain genes. So in this case, the very first variant here is a mutation in the S gene, so for the spike protein, and it's an amino acid change from D to G. So overall, across the whole genome, we see approximately 31 variants on average. And, and as you can see here, usually we retrieve very high coverage, so way above 100x. So that means, on average, every position of the genome is covered by more than 100 reads. Bioinformatics processing is, of course, a multi-step process, and we don't have time to go into each and every step here. I will highlight a couple in the next couple of slides, but just very briefly, we start, of course, with base calling. So we generate the first few files. Since we run this in a highly multiplexed fashion, the very first step then is to demultiplex the samples. So we get one fast Q file for every sample. Then we trim the sequencing adapters because some of these fragments are very short. And then during sequencing, we basically run into the adapters. So we trim those off. 
then we remove all the host weeds. Yeah, so we see varying amounts of human weeds that, of course, in this case, contaminate the viral data. And then whatever remains afterwards, we align to the SARS-CoV-2 reference genome. We mask off the priming regions because these introduce a bias for variant calling. And then we move this data set into the variant calling step and afterwards annotate all the variants if there are synonymous changes, missense mutations, nonsense, and so on, whatever we discover there. And then from the variants, we also compute a viral consensus sequence. And this consensus sequence is then used for the lineage or plate assignment. So basically determining is this now a delta variant or delta lineage or an alpha lineage and so on. And of course, the whole step or in this whole procedure, we have various quality control steps. And I will talk about those later. thing I wanted to briefly mention is this host weed cleanup. So what you see here is a simple scatter plot of the PCR, qPCR CT value on the x-axis and then the y-axis shows the host weed contamination. So as you can see, for those samples of higher CT value, we usually observe also higher host weed contamination. And, and that, of course, also makes sense because it's basically an abundance issue then. Yeah. And some of these primers just pick up apparently, you know, weakly homologous regions somewhere in the human genome, and then we see this human uh, weed contamination. But it's of course fairly easy to get rid of those. Then another step I wanted to briefly talk about is this variant calling and consensus computation. So for variant calling, we use free bayers. We use this method actually for years, and it's, it's actually quite good for, for indel calling, so for small insertions and deletions, because it includes a realignment step. And then, as I already mentioned, all the variants are then annotated. We use a tool here from our partner institute, the, the EBI Institute, where, which is called Variant Effect Predictor, and it basically translates the nucleotide substitutions into amino acid space and, and then annotates the variants for the functional impact. And there are also tools for consensus computations. We actually employ two at the moment. One is IVA and the other one is, is BCF tools. And then we run a cross-check where we compare these two consensus sequences if they agree. And then we go on into the classifications for the lineages. Uh, once we are happy, of course, also after quality control, and I will talk about this later, we then submit these consensus sequences to the Robert Koch Institute here in Germany for viral surveillance, as Vladimir already mentioned. And because of this requirement to submit everything to the RKI, we also adopted their consensus criteria. The three most important ones are shown here. So we have to label bases that have not enough coverage as N. So we basically mask them out as an N. And that is the case whenever there is less than 20 reads overlapping a certain position. We also label ambiguous bases as N. So those are positions in the genome where two different alternative bases are observed. And then it's basically unclear, you know, what is the true mutation. So those positions we also label as N. And then if we have overall less than 5% Ns in this, in this viral consensus sequence, everything is fine. We are basically ready to submit. If we have more dropouts because some amplicons might be missing or we have too many areas of low coverage in the genome, then basically the, the assembly, the consensus sequence is too fragmented and we cannot send it off to the RKI. The most difficult step is uh, the lineage and, and clade assignment. And one problem here is that there are really multiple naming systems out there historically, or the very first system was this, these pango lineages. And then later on, we also had these next strain clades, and also GISAID has, the own, has its own nomenclature. And now, since a couple of months, we also have these WHO labels, which are now most frequently used, which are these familiar lineage names like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. So what defines a lineage is, of course, the, the mutation pattern. And that's shown here at the top. So 
So this is just a screenshot of this website, this outbreak.info website, which nicely shows basically which mutations occur frequently in what lineage. Yeah? So the color here indicates the mutation prevalence. And then basically each column in that in that upper panel shows a different amino acid change in the S gene and of course in the other genes of the virus we also see see variants, but here it's for the, the spike protein. And this basically is how these you know lineages are, are classified or how the viral consensus sequences are classified into lineages. Of course for Delta for instance, there are by now dozens of, of sublineages, yeah, and again these have slightly different mutation patterns. And and the tools we are using here um are Pangolin and the GitHub site is shown there and also Nextclade, yeah. So we include this in the output and that basically helps us to get an overview of what is circulating in our area here. Then the quality control is of course very crucial in these highly multiplexed assays. So as Nayara already mentioned, on every plate we have two viral-free negative controls and one human RNA control, and then in addition one positive control. So we usually have them in the very four first spots on the plate as shown here, but we actually iterate or we shuffle them around from every plate to plate. First of all, to see cross-contamination, you know, between the plates, but also to generate a unique plate barcode. Yeah? So just to guard ourselves against human errors, we basically shuffle those controls from plate to plate, and when we then pull four plates for sequencing, we actually have a unique plate barcode just by looking at the controls. And another thing we also do afterwards in the data analysis is, of course, since we know the plate layout and we know where all the samples are, we can, of course, also check for, for sample cross-contamination. This was actually working very well in the beginning of the year because we had many different lineages here, here in Germany, so it was easier to detect cross-contamination. Nowadays, this is actually really tough because it's only Delta. and, and all the individual positive samples, of course, have a very, very similar mutation markup. Yeah. But what we are looking out for, or watch out for, is shown here on the left. Yeah. So when we see basically variants where we see two different alleles at the same position, that's basically something that you know for us is, is ringing the alarm bells. Yeah. Because usually that's not viral heterogeneity, but it is actually cross contamination. And for a bunch of those samples, we we even evaluated that by resequencing the same positive samples. So we prepared another library and then sequenced again. And so far, all of them came out clear, clean in the second one. Yeah, so clearly indicating that this was cross contamination in the first attempt. So that's certainly something to be aware of. That that can be an issue in these Amplicon designs, and especially when they are highly multiplex. Overall, I mean, this is basically looking now backwards for a number of plates that we sequenced. So how does it look like, you know, from plate to plate and overall? So the x-axis is, again, the CT value, and now on the y-axis you see the number of ends in the viral consensus. So at most this can be 30,000, obviously. So what we want to see is that our samples, and each dot here is a sample, are, of course, towards the bottom, yeah, so towards zero. So ideally, we don't have any ends in the viral consensus. And then the color indicates here if the sample can be submitted to the RKI or not. So as I said, that's basically dependent on, on this 5% threshold. And hopefully you, you can see this, that basically smaller CT values tend to, to work better, as you would expect. And at the moment, you know, our cutoff is usually around 30. Yeah? So at a CT value of 30, if you go below that, you have a really good chance that sequencing succeeds. Uh, the biggest problem in these Amplicon designs are always variants in, in priming regions. Yeah? So that's the Achilles heel of, of Amplicon sequencing. And that problem came up very early already. I think we saw it for the first time already in February or March with the gamma lineage. 
where there is a nine base pair deletion in one of the primers of Amplicon 74. And because of that deletion, we then see a dropout of this Amplicon. Yeah. So basically, that Amplicon doesn't yield any data. So in that region, we were always blind. Yeah. So if any variance happened in that area, we wouldn't see it, or only you know, partially if we are lucky that there's still some data. Yeah. And of course, these kind of variants then prompted our collaborators at, at NEB Fellow, basically a new primer mix, which they termed VARSKIP for variant skipping. And especially for the gamma lineage, and this is coming here from a better test we carried out at this time, you can actually see just by globally looking again at the genome and at the aligned data that actually the VARSKIP primers have no problems at all with this nine base pair deletion because they are outside of these nine base pair deletion. Yeah. So we actually get coverage, and also across the, the genome here, we see coverage. And in Arctic V3, we see this dropout that I just highlighted on the previous slide, but also other dropouts. So the whole idea of this new design is, of course, to, ev to avoid common variants. Yeah? So the primers have been designed outside regions that are not, you know, basically in regions that are not affected by common variants. We had the, the VASCA primers with Arctic V3 on a larger panel of roughly 100 samples, all from the data lineage, because that's basically what we have at the moment in our area. And, and the thing that, that's sticking out is really that we get better coverage of the S gene. So in this plot, the x-axis is the whole genome, yeah? so the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and then the two vertical black lines highlight the S gene. And then you see basically two graphs here, which is in blue, VASCIP, and in red, we have Arctic V3. And as you can see, VASCIP gives us better coverage of the S gene, and in particular, in this very first part of the S gene, where we had frequent dropouts with Arctic V3, we now usually get sufficient coverage to call variants. So also basically condenses data into a simple box plot, and that's shown here on the left. Yeah. So again, we compare Arctic V3 with VASCIP for the data lineage, and then the y-axis shows again the number of ends in the viral consensus sequence. Again, the lower the better, yeah. so we'd want, we don't want to see ends. We basically want to cover the whole viral genome, and it clearly seems to be the case as with the VASCIP primers, we have a better coverage of the genome. There's one important like caveat or thing to mention here. Uh, with VASCIP, one generates larger amplicons, so there are some protocol differences. So it's important to take this into account when preparing the libraries. Of course, we also compared the, the manual results with the Biomac i7 workflow. And, well, I hope it's, uh, everybody can see this here, yeah but basically there's almost no difference between manual and biomech preparations. And, and so far, we are basically very happy with the automated setup. It seems to deliver very comparable results. In summary, of course, you can basically set up your own workflow to do all these individual steps I mentioned in the beginning, but by now there has been you know, a lot of developments in the community. When we started at the beginning of the year, this looked a bit differently. But nowadays, it more, you know, it, it's more a matter of, of what system you are used to. So if you are happy with Galaxy and you are a regular Galaxy user, then there's the SARS-CoV-2 Galaxy project, which implements such a workflow. If you are more a NextFlow user, there's this viral recon pipeline which also analyzes the SARS-CoV-2 data that I presented today. There's also the Arctic NF workflow from the, from the Connor lab, and at the very bottom is our own pipeline that we currently use, which has, of course, some adaptations for, you know, the Germany setting, which, you know, I highlighted a number of times that we can submit the sequences to the RKI, and there are also steps in there now that automatically detect the primer mix, yeah, so it switches automatically for Arctic V3 and, and VASCIP and things like that. 
Another thing we set up here at, at GeneCore in Heidelberg is a web service to analyze also Sanger chromatogram traces directly. We adapted the service now also for SARS-CoV-2 chromatograms. So when we want to validate mutations by PCR and Sanger sequencing, we basically just upload here the Sanger chromatograms and then the web service aligns it against the SARS-CoV-2 reference genome and we get a variant list out also in standard VCF and BCF format, so we can just pass it on to VEP, so the variant annotation again. So it, it, it nicely kind of fits to the rest of the workflow. This is now looking at the lineage distribution in our area here, so the Weinnecker area. As I mentioned in the beginning of the year, so in January, we had a lot of lineages different wild-type lineages uh, flying around. And then there was also, a, for a short time, actually this A27 lineage here in, in Heidelberg. Yeah. So it seemed to be a bit more transmissible than the other wild-type lineages. But as soon as then the alpha lineage basically hit Germany, it was completely outcompeted by that. And then we had the third wave here in spring, which was almost exclusively alpha. And then, you know, towards the summer, we also then got the delta lineage and, and in the last couple of, of plates, we had always 100% delta. But then, of course, it's a growing amount of delta sublineages that we now observe. Yeah. So to, to conclude everything, so we sequenced by now uh, in the order of 8,000 viral genomes. So that boils down to roughly about 200 positive samples per week. As I already mentioned earlier, as soon as we select samples at a CT value below 30, there's a very high chance that these samples succeed. So the success rate is, is above 80%. And the, all the successful ones we submit to the RKI and just to mention this again, of course, this is joint work with the university clinics in Heidelberg and Mannheim, who do all, who are doing the logistics, you know, of collecting all the samples and preparing the samples, and then we pick them up and, and basically prepare them for sequencing and preparing the results. Disclaimers by Beckman Coulter that this is research purposes. And with that, I would like to go to the acknowledgments. And well, as I mentioned, there are many people, of course, at the clinics that help us, both preparing the samples, but also, as I said, with the logistics. And of course, NEB for developing the VASCA primers and uh, their support throughout the process. And uh, the same is true, of course, for Beckman Cota with automating the protocols on, on the biomech. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and we are, of course, happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, as a reminder to webinar participants, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. <coughs> all right, let's start the Q&A. So, uh, Jürgen, our first question, um, is the method published, and how can I get more details uh, about the automated method? We will publish this as a detailed method as an application note, and actually it will be available on Beckman.com. And how much time does it take for you to run the entire process, from RNA extraction, uh, library prep, sequencing, and then to data analysis? The RNA extraction takes one to one and a half hours. It's depending on whether you like to process 96 or 192 samples. The library prep on the Biomec i7 is roughly taking eight hours, for, and it doesn't matter whether it's 48 or on 96. And uh, if you are like to go on serialized mode, then, then it's faster and consecutively, but this is depending on additional hardware. And actually, currently, we are examining the possibility to use a 384-volt head, 
and then actually the running time will be the same, but actually we will then quadruple the output. Um, the sequencing itself is then depending on the process of the Illumina next week, and there we will have roughly 14 hours, including setup times, all this manual handling you have to do arrive uh, for 384 volt samples. And the data analysis will take at least on the infrastructure we are utilizing at EMBL, three hours. We have to share the cluster infrastructure, so if you have your own uh, IT for yourself, then it would be definitely faster. And with the automated workflow, uh, how many samples can you process at one time? Actually, this is, as I mentioned above, so uh, in standard, like we are currently, it's 96 uh, samples, uh, per batch, and we are just pooling four plates at the end. Uh, uh, if we are successful with a 384 wall head, then we don't have to pool at the end, then we can do everything in one run. Great. Um, and can you tell us if this workflow is applicable to other viruses? This is just dependent on the primer selection and the primer optimization, so you can nearly place the primers anywhere you like, and so, yeah, it's uh, applicable also to any type of other viruses if you like to do this. Um, and then, is there any publicly available um, bioinformatics support to use the Varskip short primer set? Actually, I don't know whether you remember one of the slides uh, Tobias presented, and there he had several links already. Um, where you can use select actually between different uh, workflows you can use for that, but there's also one I think from NEB. So uh, I think it's from GitHub and it's uh, just let me check. Uh, NEB Biolabs Vaskip it's called, and you you will find it if you're just going to GitHub. And, NEB Biolabs, or if you're just going to the normal uh, web page from NEB, and you will be uh, redirected there. So you find there uh, all reference files, and uh, you can modify the primer selection and what whatsoever. And can you tell us what read length is recommended for sequencing of libraries generated with uh, the NEB Next uh, Arctic FS kit? So the area of interest is roughly in the area of 200, 270 uh, base pairs, in, including the Illuminas, flanking Illumina sequences around. Uh, actually, as you have seen on the slides itself, the library is smearing out a little bit to the right side, as we are not doing any size selection uh, in the whole process, but this this is not disturbing at all because the clustering efficiency is really targeted to smaller smaller fragments. So it's just, just okay to do the purification in the beginning. So you will hit this area of 200 to 270. And then two times uh, 75 pair of paint reads uh, of Illumina are just sufficient to cover the whole interest, uh, to cover really the area you need. Um, to make the analysis afterwards. Great. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today, so I'm going to wrap it up there. So we'd like to thank Vladimir Benish, Jürgen Zimmerman, Tobias Rausch, Nayara Trevisan Doimo de Azevedo, and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. And as always, if you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.